Good morning, everyone. It's about 1030. Uh, welcome to uh, Coffee with Cheryl. Um, I will, uh, here's my cup. I can't necessarily promise you that there's coffee in it, but there is a morning <laughs> beverage in here. And uh, I am a happy Tuesday morning and uh, thrilled to be here with all of you and also with our wonderful host, uh, Debbie Brunig from KI. And uh, Deb, how about uh, you welcome our guests? There's still a few folks, I think, uh, trickling in and join us, but we're almost at uh, capacity. So how about we get started? Let's do that, sounds like a plan. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, on behalf of KI, I'd like to uh, share our, our thanks for you joining us this morning. A big thank you to IIDA and the industry for the opportunity to facilitate this conversation and uh, the conversations we had last year that are now moving into 2020. Um, I, I think now more than ever, the subject, the meaning, and engagement of community has taken on a vital role in our society. Uh, so a big thank you for all of you joining us today. Um, and I'm gonna hand it back over to Cheryl and look forward to a great conversation, everyone. To Cheryl's point, your coffee, your favorite drink, uh, let's have a, a, a great hour ahead. Thank you, I'm passing it back over to you, Cheryl. All right, cheers, Deb, and thank you for providing uh, coffee to everyone as well. I am going to check in with my uh, great HQ team that's manning the booth and making sure, so we are now converting you all um, from participants to panelists so that we can all have this conversation. And this is, this is not a lecture, if you, logged in expecting a lecture. This is not that. I just saw Abby Scott's beautiful face pop up. Hey, Abby Scott, member of the year. Cheers and congratulations. There's Gabrielle Bullock. All right, starting to see more and more faces joining us. Uh, so this is, this is about conversation. This is interactive. This isn't me being a talking head. So I'm giving you guys the heads up on that. In this, uh, there's Amy Gould. Hey, Amy. Um, in this series with KI, which it may have come to a number of your cities, we talk about what community means and what it means to us, what it means to um, the creation of uh, the workplace, but also retail and healthcare and hospitality. And um, as Deb knows, and as you all know, the, the very last conversation that we had, the very last uh, community of strategy conversation we had in March um, before everything changed was in Kansas City. And we were actually at a performing arts center and the city had just announced that the performing arts center was closing. Ours was the last event and they allowed us to continue to have our conversation and then shoot us out of there and the entire city was just shutting down. And um, we ended up having a really good conversation and it was purely speculative because at that point, no one was working from home, traveling was starting to cease. We didn't know what was coming at us. And so that was about 16 weeks ago, which may as well have been a lifetime ago. Um, but this notion of community, given what we are living through with both the pandemic of coronavirus and the pandemic of racism and injustice, our world has so significantly changed, but I think it re-emphasizes the need for connection. And look at us here, um, engaging and creating connections via Zoom. And so I would like to invite you all to share with me your thoughts on how we will support and reinforce and that special power that design has to create community. How will we re-engage and promote community 
once we are back at the places that we call workplace. Because right now my dining room is my workplace, but once we are back in the physical, formal workplace, how are we all going to engage in community? So unmute yourselves. Come on, unmute. <laughs> Unmuted. Unmuted. Hey. There's Sarah Kushar. There's John. Hey, Natalie Ingalls. Hey. How are you? There's Alex, Vivica. First off, I, I, uh, Cheryl, I wanted to say I'm just so happy to see all of your faces. Uh, you know. <laughs> Um, I know um, I know Zoom calling and GoToMeeting and webinars are becoming fatiguing uh, to us all. I um, I uh, I actually went for a, I exercised this morning. Uh, it's amazing how just moving the body, things that we know, moving the body, how much it helps. Um, but that we have to be so. I, I guess the word that I keeps coming up for me is intentional and one size does not fit all. This idea that policy can be overarching or that authority can be overarching or that structure can be overarching is just broken down. It, it, it doesn't work anymore. I think um, so building community in the way that social media builds a community is that people look the same or they say the same thing or they go to the same places, they eat the same foods or they travel to the same spots or they like the same art or they work at a certain, you know, so even, even that is fatiguing because we've become so homogenized. Um, there was one of the most interesting interviews that I saw. I don't know if you ever saw my, uh, David Letterman has that new series called My Guest Needs No Introduction. And he, I'm not gonna get political uh, at all. I'm just gonna state something I heard that I thought was fascinating, was that all of the technology that we have today is actually about narrowing down communities to be homogenous so that mm -hmm. when you click on Google and it knows what you search or Amazon and it knows what you shop and on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter, they know the community that you are, they're making an algorithm decision to show you what you already know. So what we are seeing is this intolerance and a growth of confirmation bias. Mm. And it's, it's just to me, um, when I like realized, you know, like I felt so naive, like, oh my gosh, I've been so duped. Something that is supposed to be convenient and easy about creating community actually has me searching for content in all the most unexpected places today. Yeah. yeah. Wanting real experiences from real people um, that I know and that I don't know. Yeah. And um, so that's just a, just a observation uh, that a realization and observation that I've had that has come together for me that I have to be, even more intentional mm -hmm. around how I build community and that being uncomfortable uh, in a community is good for my growth. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. All of those things, you know, we kind of think in terms of, you know, I hear more people talking about not when I get back to work, but kind of what's now and then what's near and what's next, right? We're kind of thinking of life in these phases and that attention to things that are genuine and things that are real. I think we are more attuned to that now. Um, in this period where we're thinking about reentry and we're all doing it at different times and at different phases, what do you think it's going to be really important Important for for design to 
communicate? You know, is it comfort? Is it safety? Is it, what will be the things that will be mm -hmm. important for you and your clients um, to communicate to their teams and to their employees? Let me, I'm looking at my friend, Sarah Kushar there. Hey, Sarah. Hi. And your firm just recently did this amazing um, survey which I have to admit, I stole some of your questions to use in a return to the work. I, I credited you though, um, but it was a great survey. What have you learned from that survey about what people are thinking and, and I think giving some, some kind of marching orders for what design needs to do? Well, I think we were all very happy to see that the, you know, we have listed out, um, I should prep this, we put out a survey to people to ask, Okay, assuming your the stay at home order is lifted and you are able to go back to the office, what is your plan? Personally, you and your situation, just to kind of understand what people are thinking, um, given their household and everything and their and how they work. And um, and one of the questions we asked was, what would make you feel comfortable to go back to the office? And we listed out like ten things, like plexiglass guards and um, hand sanitizer stations and. We were really happy to see that plexiglass guards was the very last thing people wanted because I think everyone's rushing to do this. And when this is done, those are all going to go in the garbage. And that's like, what a huge waste um, that's going to be happening all over our country and our world. So mm -hmm. like people that didn't necessarily make them feel safe, which I thought was really interesting. Most people were just wanted space. They definitely want their employers to tell them to, t to like lay down the law, like this, is that these are the rules and, and so that they don't have to call police. And I feel like that's probably because, you know, I go outside in my apartment, I just went to get my Starbucks order, thank you. Um, and half the people are wearing masks and half aren't. And I wanna yell at people and say, wear your mask, but I can't. And people don't wanna do that in the office. They want, to, they want the employer to say, like, these are the rules. Um, yeah. And I think that's interesting. Most people just want policing, they want, they want distance, they want the hand sanitizer. And um, I think that was mostly, those are the, our big takeaways from that, that particular section. Yeah. Um, Sarah, that's such a quick thing. Oh, go ahead, people I'm sorry, also, yeah. People really do miss socializing, which is no surprise. So one thing that we were trying to talk to our clients about was um, the, the quick thing to do probably right now is shut down the social spaces, but is there a way that we can do this without can we design them in a way that give distance and safety to keep them because I don't think anybody wants to go back to the office just to be head down unless you know you're trying to get out of the household with young kids um, a lot of people want to go to be around people so how do we create those spaces to make people feel safe and give that sense of community yeah that's definitely Sarah thank you for that that's definitely something we've been hearing is that people want a calm confident voice giving them direction and giving them parameters. We've lived through, you know, 16, 18 weeks of just uncertainty. And throughout the entire pandemic, there have been very few answers. And we've kind of seen it in, you know, mayors wanting one thing, governors wanting another. The World Health Organization says one thing, the CDC says the other, and people just want answers. And I think that that's something that we're all going to need to be conscious of moving forward in, you know, what's now next and, and near and next is that remembering that people need answers. They crave answers during periods of uncertainty. And this is most definitely a period of uncertainty, even if that answer is, I don't know, um, mm -hmm. hold tight, give me a minute, but communicate and it doesn't mean necessarily authority but having that voice and that confident voice to to reassure because having an answer is super reassuring cheryl. i'll add to that point cheryl sorry yeah. I'm, okay um i'll add to that point considering that i'm not at a firm and i'm on the client side yeah um, instead it's interesting because um our uh, there's multiple offices and the office that i office out of um we had a finally a virtual town hall you know it was eight it was eight weeks after everyone had to go home and everyone's just kind of craving answers as you indicated and everyone wants to know something and our executive leadership just honestly had to say i don't know and me telling you that i don't know i'm telling you that 
what we're going to start doing is listening to what your individual needs are and adjust accordingly to that. I think what our organization has learned is um, pe trusting people is important, right? Because beforehand it was, if you're not physically in the office, we don't know if you're really doing what you're supposed to be doing and so forth yeah. and so on. And so now all of a sudden, you know, um, our executive leadership goes, well, I think in the past eight weeks, and this was three weeks ago when we had this um, meeting, in the past eight weeks, we've proven that obviously all of you can function and do your job and we still run as an organization without someone physically seeing what you're doing. And so that, that was ni a nice little sigh breath of relief, but in the same token, they just didn't have the answers. And I think it was okay for them not to have the answers. Don't pretend to have pseudo answers. Don't pretend to have a, a clear path of exactly what we're going to do. Initially, we're gonna try, they were gonna try to say, okay, some of us start coming back June 1st. Then they pushed that back to September 1st because they recognized most of the staff was still very uncomfortable with this idea. Yeah. And then one of our entities just said, forget it. Y'all aren't coming back till January 1st. Wow. We got to map out what this really means being inside of the office. Yeah. So, um, so I think, you know, for all of you who are at firms right now, and I I'm in this weird place where I'm like trying to help just, you know, the dialogue and the discussion internally, right? Um, you know, I, I don't know that any of us are looking specifically for design to specifically have an answer more so than design saying we're here to support you and yeah, whatever yeah. your endeavor is, right? Um, because I think oftentimes we as designers tend to want to be like, we've got the answers. Here's exactly yeah. what you should do and how you should do it and so forth and so on. And then ultimately, and so, so being on the client side, I think we're more receptive to hearing those who say we're here to support whatever your goals are, right? So what's yeah. the goal for this? Here's some solutions that might achieve that goal versus coming in as here, we're the experts and here's our expert opinion on exactly what you should do. So yeah, that's a great, that's such a great point, Ronnie. And let me backtrack one moment. Um, Deanna Farmer Gonzalez is uh, in Miami. She's the managing principal of Gensler. I'm just taking for granted that all of you all know each other, <laughs> but you don't. And Sarah Kushar um, is the owner principal of her own studio here in Chicago. Ronnie Belazar is a facilities and design executive with Mercedes in Detroit, also on the IIDA international board, as is Deanna is a new international board member. I think I got everybody that talked and then somebody wanted to say something else. I saw, saw a hand, I saw a voice. Somebody was gonna jump out there yeah. and say something. This is Brian. Bally hey, here. Brian. How are you, Cheryl? Good. Good to see you. Um, I just wanted to add to, to both Deanna and Ronnie's points. We've been, you know, my role is to work with education institutions, campuses across the country on their design and, and how we can support that from KI. A lot of the conversations we've been having with administrations and the teachers and students themselves is really a request for agency, right? Of when we return, give us, support our agency, our ability to take care of our own hygiene needs, right? Like give, let me have the, the ownership to make my decisions on how I need a space, you know, with those soft parameters, like you were saying, Cheryl. Mm -hmm. um, give me the, give me, allow me the agency to speak uh, up to or for, you know, whatever it is that I speak for, uh, and give the agency in that space to have those conversations, whether it's around COVID, whether it's around uh, Black Lives Matter, whether it's about any other challenges or movements or things that are occurring. Um, so that's a piece that we're, we're working on at KI right now, of really digging into that agency and then how does that build into resiliency for students and for campuses? Yeah, that's perfect. Amy, were you gonna say something? Amy Gould? Um, well, I was a part of our um, reboot here at the office um, and it was very similar to how, um, Sarah, you were talking about sending the survey and we had the same results um, and having this um, very similar framework to everyone coming back. And we never, yesterday we had our all office meeting and we kind of presented the document to everyone. Um, and we were asked right away what's, like we only did phase one and it's a total of three phases. Um, what, when does phase two start? 
and it was just kind of left open ended um, what that looks like and when everyone will be back. Um, so it's interesting hearing Ronnie from you, like you got your firm was pushing out till January. And as you can see, I'm back in the office today, um, mostly work from home, but I've got two little girls and I knew this wasn't gonna work at home. <laughs> so I'm here, um, but it's, it's interesting to hear what like everybody else's perspective and just kind of assert that we're doing the right thing for us and for our team as well. So. I want to there, jump in, Amy. Yeah, please, Abby. I feel like it, I, I did raise my hand. That was weird. Yeah. I've never done that on a Zoom. <laughs> um, I feel like in the Midwest, we're always like late to the game for some, and being in Omaha, I'm literally in the center of the country. But we never left office. Um, we never had shelter-in-place orders. Um, it, was that a good or a bad thing? Maybe not. Who knows? But our company is global. So we are a big E little A firm. So we have a lot of engineering. We have a lot of scientists. We have a lot of um, <clears throat> environmental scientists. We work very closely with research organizations. And it wasn't, uh, we couldn't say like, well, you're in Chicago, you have to do this. You're here, you have to do this. And being at the headquarters, my eyes were completely open to how it does work globally more on the facilities level. So we've had, I've been like shockingly impressed at the amount of information we've got, um, easing people's minds. Some people don't take, I don't take public transportation to get to work. I literally drive seven minutes in a park from my garage to another garage and walk in the building. So we have, you know, face coverings. Um, we've, the cool thing I think that came out of this is there's anything cool. Um, and I wouldn't say cool, but we've done these almost peer reviews with other really large companies. So Union Pacific Railroad saying, here's how we're returning to office. Like, let's kind of talk about how you're returning to office because we never left. So if people don't feel comfortable, you don't have to come in. Like there's, it's this really personal accountability that you need to take. And that's been the biggest push. I, I said in an executive meeting, I can't get these people to recycle in the correct bins. And you think I'm gonna get them to wear a face covering, do this, like disinfect this. I'm like, I was more panicked and they're like, no, we, knowledge is power. We're putting this out there. Everybody has to take the quiz. You have to be accountable and we are making people have personal accountability. So it was like, the fear factor wasn't there as much. And if it was, you're not in the office. So you have to do what's right for you at the right time. And we all agreed, I think coming back to the original conversation, this redefining community, like we are a design community. You on the call, you're my design people. But I've got to know so much more about my staff and like who their other communities are and who my other communities are, not being around them. And then even my nephews talking about like their gaming friends. I'm like, that's your gaming community. Like, <laughs> like they're not your school friends. They're this kind of friend. Or like, I'm kind of missing my Neocon community this week because I Saturday thought I'm usually in Chicago at this point watching mm -hmm. a naked bike ride. Like, this is weird. Like, it's just different. So it's almost like you're, You've, you've had the time to take account of what communities you're a part of mm -hmm. and how much you're a part of those communities, including your work community and your work friends. So I want to jump in here, Cheryl, if I can. Good morning, yeah. everybody. So when we um, <clears throat> started thinking about going back to work, it's um, interesting that most of the people in the office were willing to wait to the last phase, largely because they didn't feel safe and they didn't trust. They didn't try, what do I do if Susie's not wearing her mask? Do I tell her? And so fast forward to what we're dealing with today. I don't think people are worried about social distancing, given all the protests and everything. Yeah. Some things, some people have made the choice that that's more important. So I sense more of a community and more trust through these last three weeks and not so much harping on who's going to, hold people accountable for their masks and where they're sitting. But I do worry that um, the first phase will be a skeleton crew and it won't feel like community at all. Mm -hmm. And it's likely to be just heads down. So, you know, and I signed up for the first phase. I got to get out of here. But um, <laughs> it, it's, it'll be interesting to see how we, um, 
how the community changes around all the changes that have happened in the last 12 weeks. Yeah, that's that's a great point, Gabrielle. In the, you know, it's interesting in the US, our response to returning back to the workplace and, and almost everything to do with COVID has been more about an individual response rather than a collective response. And so that's why you have very, that's Amy is sitting in her office and Abby um, is saying that she didn't have to deal with a lot of the same things that we all had to deal with, with kind of mandatory protocols. We're all at such a different place because this affected us um, from a practicality standpoint in a lot of different ways. And I think there will be some conversation, particularly um, for those of you who work for firms in multiple offices and you'll have clients all over the place who will have had a different response. And COVID will seem less serious to some people than it did to others. And we live near a community where there are a lot of restaurants and people are out and they're walking around and they don't have any masks. And I'm still wiping off my Amazon packages. So it just the the very diverse responses to how we're all coping with this, um, we're all gonna need to contend with that because there will be people who will work from their dining rooms from now until, and then there will be people in the office and then we're going to need to deal with that balance so that nobody feels like a second class citizen, whether they're at work or at home. So Cheryl, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Erica. No, no. I was going to say good morning, everybody. I was going to jump in on that point specifically. Um, and when we talk about community, I'm in a firm in Kansas City. We're about 35, and so right now we've not um, hired or onboarded anybody while we've been, you know, in this in this situation. But I I have been um, giving a lot of thought to both mentoring, um, career development. Certainly when we bring somebody new on board, how they'll understand our culture, because I think what you just said is right, Cheryl, we're not gonna probably find a place where everybody's back in the office soon anyway. And the other thing is that to the trust comment and conversation, we feel very comfortable right now because we knew everybody going into this. So I trust Johnny, Susie, you know, out there doing what they're doing because I've worked with them for 10 years or eight years or whatever. It's gonna be a little unique when you've got somebody new coming on. And so for some of the organizations that maybe have already had that, I'd love to hear from you what's working or kind of some new shifts in how you're introducing your culture and what you're doing to kind of engage somebody that might be coming in new to your organization. Anybody wants to know that? I hear that somebody's hiring right now. That would be great. <laughs> oh, fair uh, enough. We, we actually did onboard our director of marketing uh, two weeks into our shelter in place. Um, wow. And talk about like the voice of your brand and voice of your culture and sort of uh, she refers to her as like the, the cultural uh, cheerleader. Um, so it was a lot of a lot of really intentional. I love that word, Deanna. Like that's exactly right. Like a lot of intentional work to make sure that she was having, you know, coffee dates and lunch dates, and um, even some folks in her neighborhood that are are in our firm that would have like socially dif distanced happy hours, actual face to face distanced happy hours. I mean, remember those? Um, so that was <laughs> a really a really interesting thing and something I was super concerned about. Um, and so I, I think it'll actually be, the weirdness is gonna happen when we all are in person again. And it's like, oh yeah, you, you're not in just this like nine by 13 box. You're actually a human being with, you know, and, and all of that. I, uh, I think that's gonna be kind of the harder part, but intentional connection has been really, really important. And th those things that we would just take for granted, the coffee conversations, et cetera, need to be, need to be planned. Um, the other thing I, I just wanted to mention was this, we were talking a lot about sanitizing the culture out of offices. Uh -huh. And like, do we, do we just basically sanitize away everything that makes us special? Um, and we don't have an answer for that. We're, we're just, every client that I speak with, every design review in the office, it's how do we make sure we don't kill what's good? And I'm sorry, I've got yippee dogs. It's, it's not a six-year-old, it's a yippee dog. <laughs> so I'd love to hear more from people about that too. Um, Melissa, I love, I love your, sorry, Sasha, I promise I'm gonna let you talk. Um, <laughs> I love your comment because that irony, that juxtaposition of sanitizing a culture, especially at this critical moment when we're talking about diversity and the expression of multiple voices, how do we balance that? 
okay, now Sasha Wagner, new president well, of IIDA. Just, <laughs> thanks. I, I wanted to pick up on something. Melissa just made me think of something. I hadn't really considered this dynamic. You know, Melissa, you said the weird thing is going to happen when we get all back together again in person and we're going to have to sort of redefine our relationship to each other in physical space and in physical presence. And what do we like as a group? What are we, you know, um, like in our office space? And, um, you know, there's going to be this dynamic of people who are choosing, because as we just covered earlier, I think every organization we're talking about, our own organizations and, and, and client organizations, they get that you need to empower the individual to have agency, right? Uh, as Brian said, the, the, the choice to say, I'm going to work from home because that works for me, my current situation, my, you know, I'm a caregiver, whatever, I, my commute is too risky. People are going to make these personal choices. But then there's going to be this transition period where, you know, some of us are in the office together again, and some of us are collaborating. And then, you know, we're going to have people join via video, et cetera. And then that's going to increase. And more of us are going to be in the office. More of us are going to be in the office. And then there's going to be like the office people and the non-office people, right? right? And those right. non-office people might be judged. Like, why aren't you coming in? We're having a team meeting. And, you know, it's more convenient for you not to uh, commute. We're post you know, any stay at home mandates, right? Now it's a, a, you know, a situation of choice where, where you, you, you know, you're not forced to be at home, but you're choosing to be at home. And that's where the rubber is really going to hit the road in terms of how, you know, connected and, and, and close knitted we stay as, as, mm -hmm. as communities, right? As, as uh, organizations and, and so on. So it's a really interesting uh, point. And I hadn't really thought about that much about that transition period and how we navigate, you know, making Everybody, making it okay for everybody to, to make those choices on an ongoing basis. Yeah, Natalie Engels wrote a blog about um, serendipitous, spontaneous collisions. And I remember thinking about, Sasha, kind of uh, alluding, attaching to what you were saying, think about all those conversations that happen after a meeting. Like the meeting is formally over, but then that casual conversation, the, but what about, and oh, I thought about this, if you're working from home and you logged in on the WebEx or the Zoom, you're missing out on a lot of context that just happens normally and naturally um, after a meeting or before a meeting. Um, so there will be, it, it's almost like we'll be building status around the folks who are at home and the folks who are in the office. Natalie, I would love for you, if you don't mind, addressing a little bit about what you talked about with, the, with that collision aspect and how we will recapture that. Yeah, definitely. Hey, everybody, and Sasha. I'm so happy Hi. to see you. <laughs> um, I'm my little heart. We don't Love live you. that far apart than <laughs> when we've seen each other. Um, you, know, you know, with, um, uh, with uh, you know, virtual collaboration, I think what uh, we were hearing a lot of fear about at first was that you know, how are you going to connect? How are, you know, especially out here with tech, how are these companies going to really push innovation? We are brutally productive, right? And uh, I mean, I am. <laughs> I'm kind of tired. But, um, you know, and it's just, um, but, so we're going to get all that work done. We're hearing this from these companies even now. So, you know, fast forward three months. And this is what we're hearing that um, they created these like, um, if you like to garden, uh, call into this group. If you like to, you know, all this stuff. But what people were missing was exactly that, Cheryl, the, um, the sidebar conversations, which when you're not in the room, that drives you crazy. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there, there was this great empathy and equality that was formed from, you know, we get to see each other face to face. Everyone is equal at this table right now. And so how can we continue that when we move back into the office? Because we are going to have the people in the office, the people not in the office, but it needs to feel the same. So, um, so that we can keep this authenticity that we like right now, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, and so with that, I think there's, uh, you know, is there, um, uh, for a while, um, except we started getting away from this name, but because it brought back some bad memories, but is there, um, you know, a resurgence of telepresence um, or something like that? Not that, but, um, you know, I think it's just um, how can we really make sure it's not just the things we like to do on the side, but can we start to join meetings five minutes early? Do we stop meetings 15 minutes early so you can actually get into bio break? Mm -hmm. You know, so just like working in these new habits 
And that was something else I was going to, you know, as I've been listening um, to, you know, what people are experiencing in different parts of the world. Um, one of the things that, um, I don't know if Susanna is on, I think so. But, She's not. Uh, one of the things that we were talking about the other day is how uh, with Kelly Dubasar and Melissa Mizell, I know a lot of y'all know them. We were talking about how, you know, we've moved from this me movement to a we movement, and now we're in this mega we. It's almost this collective um, where we really are starting to um, uh, need to recognize the bad habits that we had and now how appropriate is this comment. There are bad habits all over the place that we need to just get rid of. And all of these habits that we healthy habits that we need to bring back and unmask bring them to the forefront and really you know start to understand that my well-being is your well-being you know my uh what i do directly affects every other person on this video you know and so and and we owe that to each other we are a big collective and that's that is the point that i think design has to have is we need to mm -hmm create these spaces that allows for that. Policies and practices have to be in place within companies, but we can really help emphasize that um, and just how you enter. What is that transition? You know, we used to have transitional spaces when you go from outside to inside in homes. And so do we bring that back to the office place? You know, just starting to think about these healthy habits. Yeah. I call those uh, I call those extra minutes appetizer or dessert. Yeah. So does anybody want to stay for you know a couple minutes after a meeting? And some people can, and some people can't. Some people are back to back, but um, I'm so writing that down right now. <laughs> <laughs> little dessert, you know, like the like the end of a a show or end of anything. It's like that's sometimes when the magic happens, right? It's like. Uh, Right. Yeah. Hey, think, Betsy Voss. Um, Oops, I'm sorry. Is oh, no. Ronnie, I, you, no. Yeah, I was just going to add one more point. Um, yeah. You know, for us, Daimler as an organization, just because the multitude of spaces that we occupy range a gamut from logistics to um, manufacturing <laughs> to office to retail, right? So it's really easy to talk about the context of the office employees working from home. But obviously, our manufacturing plants, that's not possible. So how do you create parity in an organization that has so many different modes or ways of working? And, you know, how do you, because unfortunately, our plant staff, it's all of them were furloughed until a plant can reopen and actually start manufacturing again. This is globally, they're furloughed, right? But then the administrative staff that works out of offices, for the most part, we got to keep working and we didn't have to think about the consciousness of, hey, some of our colleagues aren't able to work and aren't necessarily getting paid right now. So how do we start to think of that um, from a you know human perspective that my colleague, even though I don't physically work with them, doesn't have the same um, privileges that I do, right? Mm -hmm. So it's... There's all that also playing into what's happening in, in this realm. Um, I was going to, um, Betsy Voss, and we've got Betsy Voss sitting in the epicenter of protest. Betsy's in Minneapolis, heads her own studio in Minneapolis, and protest emanated from Minneapolis out. And we've got John Otis, who lives in New York, and New York City was the epicenter of the COVID pandemic. And Betsy, I'd love for you to give some insight about what's going in, going on in your city and how things are feeling there and how your clients are talking about kind of this, this collision of pandemic and protest. Well, I think collision is a good word. Um, so Betsy, boss, nice to see you guys. Hi, Erica. Hi, Abby. Um, I live eight blocks from where George Floyd was killed. So, and I'm sitting here, so it's my neighborhood. We, we, we were definitely um, a community that's trying to rebuild. I think um, uniquely positioned, I think COVID has taken all of us to a new headspace of the unknown flexibility change. Everyone's working differently. And then we kind of faced the worst thing we could face. And I think we kind of exploded. 
and I think that trickled to everybody. Everyone's been touched by this, which is pretty incredible. Um, so I, I would say we're, we're still in the thick of it. It has affected everybody, every client I have. Everybody basically took a mental health week last week to work on this community, to get out there, to pick up glass, to do food drives. I mean, literally everyone. So I've never been more proud of the together whole Minneapolis than I've seen before because now this isn't just them it's us and that has been a pivot that is a radical pivot in minnesota if you've ever been here we're good at us but only certain kinds of us and now we're us for everybody which i've never seen before so i think that that's a good thing i also think we can we are people of action in minnesota and i do think we will lead um change we're going to lead it we're going to kind of rethink what a police department can be we're going to rethink what community is so i think it's exciting and it's terrifying to lots of people, but that's probably a good place where we need to be. And John, um, you haven't come back to the city yet, right? Or have you? Well, um, I've been in the city a number of times uh, for a variety of reasons, um, but have mainly stayed outside the city. Um, you know, it's it's a very it's very weird. It's been strange to go to the city and have empty streets and so on. Um, and knowing people who are, uh, you know, who are resp first responders to health, you know, healthcare workers and so on, it's been really strange, powerful experience to uh, hear their stories. Um, you know, from my point of view, also we're talking about community. Uh, one of the things I wasn't going to mention is that um, while I'm not in an office in a traditional sense, I have my own studio, but it's a couple of people and um, an academic obviously is another, another idea, but community, um, I feel like what's really been missing is us, all of us together, like Neocon, for example, right, is a great opportunity for us as a community to come together every year. And, and I miss also in New York, the events that happen, whether they're IIDA New York events or there are other manufacturer showrooms having events that we can go to and attend and be a part of our design community. I think that's a really powerful thing that we have that's been missing from this whole thing. You know. Um, we, we adapt to the office environment and, and a lot of people have had really excellent comments about what's been missing from the collaborative process. But I really feel like as a design community, this is for me, the thing that I've felt um, that's been missing the most, especially when we come to a time like this, where we're going through this horror and we, we don't have each other to be there to lean on in a much more communal sense, right? We're at a distance. Um, I mean, it's been a, it's been a, terrible experience I think for for to, to go through and it's made me really rethink things a lot and I'm sure it's been true for many of you um, and rethink what I do and you know and, and, and as as some of you know that I'm, I'm trying to launch this foundation the diversity by design foundation and it's now make making that much more important for me is what I really want to focus on what I really want to do and education in general I think right now you know it starts there this whole thing really starts at that level. I mean, we're not gonna change anything unless we, we start at the educational level. So for me, it's become like this just powerful magnet that's pulling me um, to, to do something, um, to do something uh, you know, that has a benefit in the long term. Um, and that's, you know, and that reflects our community in a way too. And I miss that, I miss IIDA, I miss being together with all of you um, and my fellow board members. Um, talking about this like what are we going to do like what what are we going to do i mean cheryl's incredible about what she says you know and but we need to come together i think as a board and talk about this as well so i know i digress cheryl is you know i do that <laughs> you know it's it's not john otis if you don't digress we we love your tangents um well, but you and betsy both beautifully articulated this attention to us and betsy i love your the minnesota focus that once upon a time us meant something very different in Minnesota and now us does truly mean all and you know I I want to ensure that it continues to mean all right that we're not just reacting this week and maybe a little bit next week but then the week after that it starts to uh, it's not as important or crucial um, and it, it is going to take all of us to make sure that we we stay on that that path to us i think is going to be incredibly important jane hallinan we haven't heard from you yet how's life in pittsburgh i 
Cheryl. Hey, everyone. Think and Pittsburgh are good. Um, it's been a similar uh, reaction to um, the rest of the country. Um, Pittsburgh, I think, has been this kind of quiet, uh, but still quite loud um, voice in what's been happening in the country with protests um, going on still every day of the week for the last, I think, 10 days now. Um, and I think what we're starting to see a lot of is um, these continued actions and not just voices of support, but real um, actions in support of our um, community and in general. And I think what I'm most excited about to um, get back into the office and do is that um, Perkins Eastman sits uh, right in downtown Pittsburgh right on the edge of it um but we kind of are in this quiet bubble and um i've always wanted our office to get more involved and participate in the downtown community um and what i'm really excited to get back and do is to visit um all of these amazing art galleries that are downtown so many of them are free and um this just amazing resource to artists and people in our communities that were just are there and are right in front of us and we're not um utilizing not utilizing but not accessing them Access. to our greatest ability and um i think that's um so unfortunate that we've been downtown for 25 years and um i don't feel that we are actively engaged in our community and i think that that's what each of us is starting to do now as we want to support um businesses that are owned by individuals of color and to support artists um looking around at some of the art in my house i'm realizing how guilty i am personally of not having art that represents more individuals of color um and i think that it's that harsh realization that we're all having um and just last week i you know you had seen all the posts online about being silent in these opportunities and we all thought i thought to myself i haven't been silent i've been posting online i've been doing these things uh, reaching out to some of my friends, but what I had realized that I had missed is reaching out to my coworkers, and um, that is the community that even though we talk all the time about projects and things like that, we're touching base, we're doing happy hours, um, we're starting to have more conversations with one another about what is happening, how we can be engaged as a firm and as um, a group of friends and how we can really um, make this better. Um, and Ronnie was actually part, I loved the panel that you had participated in Friday last week, um, talking about how we can start in education and focusing on talking to individuals who may not know that architecture and design is this um, uh, place where everyone can be welcome and should be welcome. And I thought that all of that just, my mind kind of just exploded with ideas of how um, Pittsburgh is not a super diverse community. And I was really blown away to find out that the gentleman who was leading the panel was from Pittsburgh. And um, I thought that that was so powerful to hear about, um, well, Pittsburgh isn't very diverse and some of, so many places around the country aren't so diverse. So our firm isn't diverse. And that has been an excuse for so long. And I think now we're starting to see actions that we can take to make this, to make Pittsburgh a better place um, for all individuals, um, especially our friends of color who have been so often um, not included in all of these opportunities for growth, um, especially in Pittsburgh where we're booming with health, um, healthcare companies and technology companies. Um, and how we need to really make sure that all of our voices in the city are heard. So yeah. Thank you, that's Jane. That's what's going on in Pittsburgh. Yeah, thank you. And Alex, um, you're there in Philly. I saw your little note that your neighbors were having a pool party. So <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't like a real pool party. It was just like a dad and his children making a lot of noise. <laughs> mm -hmm. That works too. So, but they're, they've, they've taken a recess now at this point, so. How um how's life in Philly? And you're you are a healthcare designer, and you yeah. know this conversation is an intersection of all of the things that you incorporate in healthcare design. 
Absolutely. And it's been, I have been taking notes like crazy since this has started because there's been so many relevant things that have popped up. And I, I'm going to take a second to sidebar from healthcare and just say, when we're talking about us and what it means to be a community, something about us, like U.S., like trust has us in it. But I feel like right now, trust has been hugely kind of underwritten because I want to say we're going to do all these things and be a community and build together and do better. But when I walk down the street, people like look at you and they're like, oh, and they like run across the street. Or if you're in the market, everybody's like trying to dodge each other. And when we're talking about going to the office and like, do you trust your colleagues? Because unlike you, Melissa, and your company, I feel like on our company calls, people are like, nope, I don't trust anybody to wipe down your keyboard or to wipe down a doorknob. So there's like something very unnatural feeling I feel about the current state of where we're existing because everybody is paranoid for lack of a better word because you just don't know and there's been so many different directions even here in Philly between you know, my company so I'm at SBA we have an office in New York and an office here in Philly and just a very different kind of direction from the governors and the mayors between New York City and between Philly and we were working in our office until the absolute last minute until somebody literally said okay no you can't come into work because we're still coming into work and most of us commute by um, public transportation and all these things but it's like we're being told one thing, and then the president of the company is trying to tell something else. And there's just there's like, how do you trust when everything's constantly changing, and when all of the rules and the direction seem to just be shifting because nobody really knows what to do. And the same thing kind of ties into healthcare systems. They come. A lot of our clients have come to us. A lot of projects were put on hold because healthcare systems had to pivot. That's another thing. All these words that are like trending now because of this, like pivot and pivot. the new normal and all of this like playing bingo with COVID terminology. So that's been unprecedented. Well. Don't forget unprecedented. <laughs> so like all of the things that I would be happy to not hear for a little while if we ever get to that place. But um a lot of our projects were put on hold because a lot of healthcare clients had to pivot and stop what they were doing as far as new construction and create more beds where they can have COVID patients and they had to transition funds and to make sure they had the right PPE and all of these things in place and Everybody, all the healthcare firms were all of a sudden re putting out the same articles about how we're going to help your hospital be better, and we're going to, you know, this is how we are going to help with COVID. But it was really all the same information we're all saying, but branding it with a different logo. So it's just like everybody wants to be responding, responding. Everybody wants to be the expert. Everybody wants to to be at the forefront. So to me, again, it comes back to feeling less like a community and more isolated because everyone's trying to one up each other when really there might be a benefit if we were working together more to really try to come up with a solution but then we don't trust each other so it's like everything's kind of counteracting oh. the other thing yeah it's, all, yeah. it's been a lot <laughs> it's been a lot that's can I well jump said in? can i jump in yes. cheryl because um Please. alex you made a good point and i'm thinking about you know everybody jumped in who's going to design the quickest fastest alternate care site right and in the last two weeks how many firms have jumped in Right, they want to be first to respond to George Floyd's death, death, and what the firms are going to do. And I sure hope that firms do what they say they're going to do. And this is not a campaign, because it's feeling like a campaign. And it's so trendy. I, it's very yeah. trending. And you know, uh, I just I feel very strongly that this just can't be what yeah. happened in June and July right. in in the world. Right, right. Excellent, excellent point. It's those messages need to be genuine to who those organizations are. And there's certainly, I've seen a number of posts. There was a firm that posted, they stand with the black community, they're supportive and all these things. And the first comment was, but you design prisons. So how do you reconcile that? And, you know, and we live in a comment culture where the comments become the content and that takes on a whole other flavor, but you're right, those messages shouldn't be messages because that's what everybody feels they must do. You've got to believe in and, and be that message as well. Um, we're, we're, we're running out of time and we didn't hear from Fiona and Hillary and I don't want to ignore the two of you, so I just want to check in on Atlanta and Kansas City. So Fiona? Oh, you might need to unmute. Oh, mute. Okay. Um, so, gosh, we we covered so much today. <laughs> and I'm not even sure where to start. 
That's okay. Um, because um, obviously, um, you know, COVID has turned this city upside down. Uh, George Floyd's death has turned this uh, whole city upside down again. Um, and I just saw the news this morning that we have voting issues apparently with our new machines. So we're one more time upside down. Um, yeah. And at the same time, we're trying to figure out how to get back to it. Um, yeah. And so um, we, um, like Sarah and others, have um, had very honest and open conversations and um, uh, questionnaires to our staff um, and learned a lot, uh, uh, learned a lot um, that we didn't expect. Um, we knew that. Um, that we had uh, differing opinions. We didn't know how different they were. We had 50% right. of our office were ready to come back to the office. I'm in the office. We're not officially back in the office, but um, I have definitely, um, it's, not my, it's not necessarily my comfort zone. It's, um, it's how I work best. And um, since our stay at home has been lifted in Atlanta, and the firm has been flexible enough that we are at our own risk while we are here. So we're all cleaning. <laughs> There's a few of us. There's not very many of us. Yeah. Um, but we've shifted our, our uh, return to work several times. But it's also going to shift our culture because what we've learned through this process is uh, very similar to others. That, um, especially what Ronnie said earlier about the company learning that you, we can be productive with people now. And I think there's a lot of firms that are dealing with that, you know, that they couldn't necessarily believe that they could be productive working from home. Um, we can be productive working from home. And, um, but, and we have a lot of uh, people in the office that want to continue to work from home. Complete culture shift for us. And we are being as flexible as we can. Even when we come back, you don't have to come back. We need everybody to be at a point where they feel safe um, and uh, where they feel uh, and comfortable um, and we are responding to that um, and trying to be as nimble as possible and it's going to be a continuation of being upside down for us uh, we we crave that connection yeah um, we crave it and I know that I, I know that I do so when we see people in the office those of us who have come back you know occasionally we're like hey how are you doing it's so good to see you um, and, and you know, as Sasha said, you know, this weekend I was like, oh my gosh, I would be at Neocom right now. I would be right. connecting with the new with the board. I mean, right. It, right. Uh, so, you know, in similar ways to seniors not happy graduations, um, you know, this is a, a year of change and it will um, define us in many ways. Yeah. And how we react to it, and everybody can react differently to us with it. It isn't us, but it, it is being driven by an I as well. Um, right. And so I hope that the us prevails. <laughs> I hope that, um, that we become a stronger, more unified um, uh, company, a more unified um, uh, industry, a more unified country. Um, um, uh, but it's going to take time. And it will take time. I think um, that... We're here to there. we're here to listen to everybody. Yeah, your your phrase upside down is is right on spot. We've got um, we're almost right at our time, but I want to I want to make sure we hear from Hillary and Vivica. You're still there. I want to ask the two of you, what are you optimistic about? And then after you guys, I'll turn it back over to Debbie because I know everybody's got another Zoom call they've got to probably jump on. So Hillary. <laughs> so with, what are you optimistic I, about? Okay. I'm optimistic about the fact that I see incredible resilience in everyone around me. Um, these are, as you said, unprecedented times, and we're all figuring out ways um, to live our lives and be the best people we can be and support each other, even though we're not necessarily sitting next to each other. Um, it's so interesting to hear everybody talk about the word trust. It is probably the, mo the, the most often conversation we've had, both with our staff as well as with our clients. Um, as designers, we're, we're inherently problem solvers. 
And this is a really, this is a, a, a moment in time, we don't have the answers. You know, we're desperately to want to provide answers uh, to um, our clients and, and it's almost impossible to. So it's interesting, what we've been reaching out to our clients about are the, the idea of trust and that the uh, new culture of trust has to be created in every organization. Um, Ronnie talked about the idea of trust, you know, uh, employers trusting their staff that they're actually doing their job and being productive, but it's now pivoting to um, staff trusting their employers and trusting each other. And so it, it's an incredibly powerful um, moment in, in many organizations where, where culture is changing and has to revolve around the idea of trust. Right. Perfect, Vivica. I'm going to give you bonus points for using pivot and unprecedented in that. Um, and then, uh, Hillary, let's, uh, let's get a last comment from you. And then, Deb, I'll turn it over to you. Sure. What, what are you optimistic about, Hillary? I love the two words or phrases that I've heard a couple times in this morning's conversation, nimble and I don't know. Two things that can be a little unscary and kind of uncertain, but if we think about the last 80 odd days working from home, we've had to lean into both of those things and think about how much we've figured out how to collaborate digitally that we may not have done before and figuring out how to connect all of our different global locations and just putting ourselves outside of the comfort zone that maybe we wouldn't elect to go into, I think has pushed us to do some really amazing and creative things. And I'm hoping that leaning into Nimble and I don't know through the rest of this year for the foreseeable future that we continue to push those words and thoughts in all avenues of life, not just design, but diversity and creativity, inclusion. Um, I'm really excited to see how people continue to lean into the unknowns. Yeah, that's, that's perfect. Thank you, Hillary. And, and just for me, thanks so much to all of you. You, you, all, you all are my us. And uh, thank you for being a part of this conversation. And I'll turn it back to our host, uh, Debbie, for Quick wrap up. Real quick wrap up. Thank you, everyone. Wow, your insight, your passion. Of, and I think that level of trust as we heard, this group really represents that. And we can't thank you enough for sharing that today. Uh, I would be remiss without saying, Cheryl, thank you, a profound thank you for your continued leadership. You are the voice we turn to. Uh, so thank you for your continued work on inclusion equality and equity in the workplace and beyond. So with that, thank you everyone. Um, we're going to continue the conversation, follow us, more to come around uh, the important community. Thank yeah. you. Thanks thank everybody. You. Be Thanks. safe, Bye. be well, Bye. see you soon. Bye. Bye. All right, take care. Bye.